In this episode of Weld Wednesdays with AWS, I'm up here in Cleveland, Ohio for the 2022 World Skills Special Edition Welding Competition taking place at Lincoln Electric. I had an amazing opportunity to sit down and chat with some of the previous welding medalists from the World Skills Competition. Skills USA is an amazing competition that takes place every year, where winners from the region get a chance at the state competition, and those winners go to national. And the winners from national, they head on to World Skills. This is an incredible, life-changing opportunity for young men and women to showcase their talents on the world stage when it comes to welding. I highly encourage that if you're an administrator, look into hosting a Skills USA competition at your school. If you're an educator, encourage your students to participate. If you're an employer, show up and support these events and possibly hire some of these students. If you're a manufacturer or distributor, consider donating some tools, materials, or prizes for these events. If you're an inspector, CWI, or a professional welder with the ability to inspect welds, volunteer to be a judge. If you just want to support the skilled trades, volunteer to help out an event. These young men and women need our support, and this industry needs our help. Let's go ahead and promote the skilled trades in general, but more so, let's promote welding. Arc Junkies presents Weld Wednesday with AWS. Brought to you by the American Welding Society. And now your host, Jason Becker. start off with some introductions. Go ahead and tell us your name, when and where you competed, and where you placed. So my name is Brandon Mulebrandt. I competed in 1995, Lyon, France, came home with the silver medal for the United States. I'm Nick Peterson, 1993. I competed in Taipei, Taiwan, came home with a bronze medal for the United States. And I'm um, Joe Young. I competed for the United States in Calgary, Canada, 2009. I came home with a silver medal. Uh, Brad Klink competed in 2011 in London, England, came home with a silver medal. Ray Connolly, I competed in 1999, Montreal, Canada, gold medal. Jeff Putnam, been on the committee for 30 years, did not compete. I'm Matt Hayden, uh, I competed in the pre-trials in 92-93 and um, part of the World Skills Committee for the United States with AWS. Andrew Codden, I competed in 2015, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Came home with a medallion of excellence in fifth place. Uh, Chandler Vincent, I competed in 2017 in Abu Dhabi. Came home with a medallion of excellence, fifth place. Awesome, guys. Thanks for being here. What was What's it like going through this competition? I mean, to, to have that honor of bringing home a medal for the United States. I mean, this is ultimately the Olympics when it comes to welding. When it comes to our industry, this is our professional sport. You know, maybe I'll kick it off. Um, for me... I mean, it's a huge honor, but being a bronze medalist at that stage of the game, I was disappointed. Um, I wanted to do more because the whole process taught me a level of excellence to strive for. And when I didn't reach it, I was disappointed at that point. But on the flip side, too, I was incredibly proud of it because what an honor to be able to be the one kid from the United States to represent our entire country, our entire welding industry, overseas to compete at the most difficult and challenging welding contest that exists. These welds are, you know, we, we expect perfection, and there is no such thing as a perfect weld, but we vow to attain it. Simple as that. It's Mount Everest. Not everybody can climb Mount Everest, but you gotta try. And if you didn't try, how are you going to know? And that's what it's all about. You know, I tried. <laughs> oh, wow, well, look what it did for me. Gave me a scholarship to get a welding engineering degree that I would have never done otherwise. And it changed my life completely. I, I have opportunities today that I never would have had before. So 
there's such a double-edged sword that I was disappointed in myself, but then on the flip side, it's like, wow, what an appreciation for the incredible opportunities. And then circling back, though, is it's pretty sad that our society doesn't value this level of success in something that truly contributes to our society and our modern way of living. You know, we, we idolize athletes and we idolize lots of things, but you know, those athletes can't play in that stadium without us. So it's kind of a interesting thing. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it kind of saddens me because I was talking to uh, Chandler yesterday out there on the competition floor the fact that, you know, like all the other countries, their government supports them. Their government funded, housing subsidized, uh, food, clothes, water, like everything's taken care of so that all they can do is focus on training. We're over here, you know, had it not been for folks like the American Wilding Society and Lincoln Electric and, you know, the other sponsors that endorse this and support this type of stuff, it wouldn't happen. I mean, I, mean, I remember talking to Carl Peters back in 2015 when I first got into welding education, and he was explaining how this stuff happens in other countries. I mean, Brazil has buses that roll up, and they can take 20 to 40 students on at a time and teach them, you know, cosmetology, uh, culinary, uh, electrical, HVAC, welding, plumbing, all these different skilled trades. And over here, it's kind of left to, you know, maybe a, a high school ag teacher to get somebody interested in doing this. And nobody knows about it, so they, they don't understand – you know, the possibilities, what's actually attainable. You know, if I go there and I compete at my, my local ski or skills uh, regional competition, what could that then do for me? They don't understand you can go to state, you can go to nationals, and then you can get the chance to go to world, world skills and compete on a, a world stage. I, I would probably say on my part, I won't be as long and lengthy as with Nick. I think he pretty much summed it up. But I would just say a, a biggest honor in a lifetime represent the United States. Yeah, without a doubt. One thing I would add is that, um, you know, you could go around this table and ask, except for Ray, uh, who got the gold the year that you competed? And at the time, at that moment in time, it's a big deal, you know. I remember taking fifth place, not podium after, especially having a, uh, a tough shoes to fill. I had three silver medalists right before I competed, uh, 2009, Joe Young, Brad Clank, 2011, and then Alex Paskowski. 2013 in Germany, all silver medalists. So, I had, you know, big shoes to fill. So getting that fifth place, you know, that I took it to heart. Just even, even before that, just getting there was a, was a, a feat in and of itself, training out of the basement, saving up $20,000, spending $20,000, seven years of training to try to make it to the world skills. I had to take that into consideration, of course. Um, but then as I went on years later, uh, adding on to what Nick was saying, World skills that what everybody's sitting here at this table, whether you're Jeff Putnam as a committee member and never competed, uh, but has believed in what we're doing, or you're um, Matt Hayden who had a guy compete, he never competed himself for the for the world competition, um, but it's a mentality, and that's what Brandon and Nick have always said, and Ray have always said it's a mentality. Uh, yes, it's important. We we want to obviously take home some medal, but it's the longevity of what are you giving back? It's the longevity of how can you change the industry? Every single person sitting at this table is changing the industry in a big way. Whether we're um, like Brandon, he goes to uh, Lincoln and that, well, he goes to Hobart first and then works for Lincoln and now he's um, Southern Regional Trainer in the Southeast. Or Nick, he's writing curriculum for Miller, Chandler, all the uh, medals that he's cutting up for the Skills USA competition, World Skills. And I can just keep going around with uh, Ray and Jeff and every single person, it would t you know, we could fill up books of, of what each person in this room has been doing to help the industry and further the industry. We're not just trigger pullers. We don't just go right back in and fall in line with the other, uh, the other welders that are there. We're trying to bring them up to the level that we know is obtainable. So at the end of the day, that is the true gold medal. We're coming home and we have that gold medal mentality and we're raising that standard and that bar every single day we're on the job. People see just the enthusiasm that we have when we get on the job. Quick story, I walked into my, um, my work one day, had no idea my, my boss uh, says, hey, can you come in here and meet somebody real quick? I went in, started talking to him. Within five minutes, I was, you know, oh, hey, see, nice to meet you, see you later. I walked out of the room, my boss came back 
over to where I was in the next room over, and he said, do you know who that was? I said, no. He said, that's the, that's the highest person that you can go to at the gas company that we, that we service. And uh, as soon as you walked out of the room, he said, he's not a welder. He says, he does not have a mentality of a welder. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a working supervisor. I you know weld. And um, that's the kind of mentality that all of us bring. When we walk into a room, we're excited about welding, which a lot of people aren't. Welding has been, for the longest time, I think, just another step for a labor to get a, a pay raise. It's not something that have, you have a burning passion for. And to top off that you can you know, represent the United States, the honor in that is incredible. So. I, th I think with you know, welding, like many skilled trades, it's, you're a craftsman. You know, you've got to take pride. You've got to take honor in that. And I think at, at any level, what are you, whether you're competing or not, I know a lot of people that are, you know, truly passionate about this industry. And that's the cool thing to see. And then as I look around this table, the fact that, you know, all of you are passionate. Like, you're, you're my kind of people. I don't, I don't fit in this clique because I see you guys have your own thing going on. But, like, you're my kind of people. You're, like, well nerds. Like, I, I get, it. yeah, I get, I get super excited and passionate about welding because at one point somebody saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And, you know, took an opportunity to teach me this trade, this craft, this skill. And I felt, you know, it's my obligation to give back. And that's exactly what all of y'all have done. You know, every competitor since I think Nick's the, I don't want to throw, throw shade, but I think you're the oldest one here. I don't want to say oldest, but like, um, He's the oldest okay, but well, as far as when it comes to competing, but since, you know, 93, when you competed up till, you know, present day, you all are still working together to bring up the next welder you know to bring up the next competitor for skills usa you guys are out there you know completely like giving back to the industry like i know chandler's been working with jordan who's out there in the booth right now competing and it's really cool to see that you know once you kind of you know get brought up to this level you have an entire team that's there and willing to help you and i'm sure all of you would jump in to help train the next competitor for skills usa no, no question and you just brought up it struck a chord quick so that's why i grabbed the mic here fast um Working together, this committee is the perfect example. And a matter of fact, this room is the perfect example of working together. I'm kind of tearing up because it's powerful stuff. It's what got me involved to want to support. Because when I was competing at nationals, I saw Lincoln guys pushing Miller machines around and Miller guys pushing Lincoln machines around and Hobart people put everybody working together for the good of our industry and our kids. Well, in this room, you've got Lincoln. We're at Lincoln Electric. This is an amazing facility. I work for Miller Electric. Jeff works for ESOB. Brandon here is at Lincoln. And we come together as an industry to raise the bar. We work together to make this happen. Matt, I believe you, you were going to say something? What I was going to talk about was kind of the, the history. Um, you go back to nationals, you know, and, and we didn't realize it at the time, but uh, Brandon and I and Nick all competed at nationals the same year, you know, and um, – Years later, you know, we meet and start talking about, you know, what, where we've been. And then Brandon brought it up and he's like, well, you were silver medalist and we were on stage together. And, and lo and behold, dug up an old picture and found a picture of, of us back in the day. You know, we were all three at nationals there. Um, you know, and that's where I think I got into education and I think it was so that I could – pay back or pay forward to the craft, you know, and I think Brandon's always said that, you know, hey, we're, we're paying, you know, paying it forward, you know, paying the craft back. And I think that's why, you know, I've, I've been really fortunate. Uh, I have a lot of good uh, students and, but I have a lot of good friends to help out, you know, and, and if I need something, you know, I can call any one of these guys in this room and, you know, pick their brain you know, or, you know, if there's something I need, they, there's always the support there. And so this group, you know, and, and I've been involved with it for, on, on the committee for probably about 10 years now, close to it, I guess. And, you know, I've had students come through. Um, you know, I went through the pretrial process, um, didn't get to go and, and compete, and I'm a competitive person. And so, you know, like Nick was saying, he was disappointed. Well, at nationals, when I got a silver medal, I was disappointed. You know, I was up on stage pissed off a little bit because I just took second place, and the guy that beat me had been training with the United States' first gold medalist, Robert Pope. Came from the same school, you know, and it was a year after Robert had 
won, you know, the first American to win a gold. And so, you know, that's the guy that beat me, and I'm sitting here beating myself up over, you know, that. And so, you know, that that made me, you know, want to push myself. And then now that I got students, I want to push them, you know, um, to be better. And so that's it's kind of a cool story where it goes back to people that you didn't know and you have so much in common with, you become friends with. If I could just add one thing, going back to the history and um, exactly what Matt was saying, Robert Pope, who wasn't able to join us this year over uh, some complicated reasons, um, he, I think every single one of us in this room heard the, the story, the legend of Robert Pope, the first gold medalist in 1991 for the United States, first gold medal that we ever had. We got involved in 1975, and we were not funded by the government. So we had to go to sponsors, and we were relying on um, our instructors. In, you know, uh, it, as the United States, we were relying on the instruction of the of the instructors to bring us up. And it wasn't until 1989, uh, my instructor was at school with Mark Belleville. He went over to the UK in Birmingham, UK, and that was when um, Ed Bonart was the first year uh, expert. He was taking over for Gene Hornberger. And so when he went over there, he had no idea what it was all about and everything was all, you know, there was not, not a lot of communication, no internet, no uh, computers and whatnot. So when he came back, he said, this is how we're going to structure our training program where we need to, we need to jump the bar. And um, at the same time, uh, Robert Pope was competing at P-TECH down in um, Clearwater, Florida, and he was competing with his, with his, uh, with his, uh, Teammate is uh, the kid he went to school with. What, what was it? Correct. Jim Davenport, and both of them were neck and neck in all their competitions coming up. And Robert ended up winning it, and then uh, winning the right to represent the United States. And he went to uh, train with Ed, and he was just relentless. He, Ed was like, "This is great. That's the first year I'm actually taking over. This is the first time I'm taking over for, uh, you know, as a real contender." And he ended up getting the gold medal. In 1991, every single one of us has heard that story, and every single one of us was like, "I want to do that." So I, I did want to pay respect to, to Robert. He wasn't able to join us here, but um, his story really—that's um, where it all. That Robert Pope is where it all started. And actually, from that school, you ended up having two more competitors. You had Brandon Mubrant in 1995, and you had Deanne Tran in 2001. Or 2001 was Deanne Tran. Both of them came from that school, and. Um, Mr. Galen, he was Jerry, Jerry Galen, Galen, Galleon, Galleon. Um, I mean, that was, what a, what a, uh, a testimony to, to just the history of, you know, all of us hearing that same story. That was the first story I ever heard from my instructor, from Mark Belleville, who competed the year before Robert. And I heard the, the story of the legend of Robert Pope. And I said, that's what I want to do. As soon as I heard that story, I knew at that moment I was going to be, and that was the first week I started welding. That was like the first day I started welding. Just to add to that a little bit, um, so 1991 was the first year that the American Welding Society officially created the whole pretrial process. So since then, we actually have a 100% medal rate. A medal of excellence is still a medal at World Skills. You have to hit a threshold to get that medal. That's still a medal. So whether we had gold, silver, bronze, or medal of excellence, we have a 100% medal rate with our program and our training system that we do. So it works. It needs to get better, though. Why? Because the competition's getting better. We need more time for our training. We don't have a lot of time. Our success occurs. We pick our welder roughly 90 days out, maybe six months max. Other countries are competing. They're, they're practicing their whole years life. Ahead. Their whole life. Yeah. State-funded. We're scrimping and scrounging and doing anything and everything we can. And without Chandler Vincent and WelderMade.com and his amazing business that he started he's changing the game for everything state contests national contests world here we're getting laser cut parts now it's a whole different game yeah because the parts are just one piece of the puzzle but everybody needs the same exact part exactly and that's that's one thing that chandler and i were talking about yesterday is there's so many programs out there that they, they teach the basics they might you know cover the fundamentals but they're not doing the project-based learning I've held competitions at my school numerous times, and the number of students, that, and, and nothing against the students, but when they come in, 
they can't read the blueprints. They can't read the tape measures. They're not sure how to operate, you know, which end of the square. And, you know, to, we have to bring up all of the different schools, all of the programs, all the people that are passionate, and we got to get the right people in those chairs to help educate and inspire the next generation of welders. Yeah, that's, that's right. You, set, you, you hit it right on the head there. Um, we're trying to elevate our whole country. We're trying to raise the bar in every state. And so we've, we've, we've kind of went backwards, looked at all the states, and realized that there's some states that don't have the same opportunities as others. And for the past several years at Nationals, there's been a top, top set of schools that have been, been on the top for several years. And um, we're trying to figure out a way to, to elevate the bar across the whole country and get everybody all the information they need, all the material they need, uh, to make sure everybody has the the same opportunity. That way we can elevate our whole country and uh, start getting that gold medal. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of uh, the skilled uh, people from Skills USA, a lot of them train or come out of Utah. Uh, that must be something they put in the water out there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> elk, elk meat. You know, one thing that I think, talking about how these other countries support their competitors, one thing that has amazed me the more I've been involved with it is it's amazing that we're performing at the level we are because almost every competitor that I've known since I've been involved not only was training to get better but they were also trying to still work a job to support their self during that you know I mean you you basically got to be willing to give up one to two years of your life to do this competition if you really want to go all in I mean, you know, so it, it didn't start six months ago. These guys have been training for years. And I know with my competitors, there's been nights that we've been at the school past midnight trying to, you know, finish up projects to get a ship date, you know, to meet a ship date or, you know, whatever the case was. And they were trying to work a job, you know, to make money. And, it, you know, it's it, so trying to find that balance with these guys, I mean, it, it's amazing that we're able to perform, and I just think, you know, what if, what if they could dedicate 100% of their time to training to get ready for this instead of, well, i got to work these days and I can come practice these days, and, you know, since I don't have enough time to practice, you know, me and the, and the student are staying until 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning to get it done, you know. Well, I know I can say that when I competed, the team that I had working with me, Brandon, Nick, Robert Pope, Glenn Kay, um, you know, they had me feeling, you know, when I went to Montreal, Canada to compete, they had me feeling as, you know, this was just another competition. They had me so well trained and focused. I was just there to do what I was trained to do. And I walked in, I did what I was trained to do, left and came home with the gold medal. And, you know, I can't thank them, thank them enough. And that's what, you know, I think we continue to do the team we have is continuing to try to make our competitors, you know, so well trained. And not only are we, you know, doing it to, you know, add them to the workforce at an exceptional level with, you know, coming away with almost like say 20 years of welding experience after what, you know, maybe three years of, you know, training at 16 hours a day, you know. It's all I, that overtime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Paying off. So. What so what I what I kind of think you know to kind of listening to everything is this committee is so unique you know you think about you're hearing all of our names and 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 what we've done but it's all of us putting back into the system what we took out our committee is made up of about eighty percent of past competitors so we know what this whole thing meant to us and now we're passing on to next gens so I chair this committee. Nick, Nick co-chairs, Ray Conley's our, our uh, U.S. expert, Chandler's deputy expert. We're, we've, we kind of put the whole thing all into play, and we've all been investing time and, and supporting next gens, and, and again, our committee is 80% past, past competitors. Jeff Putnam is probably the most senior individual on this committee, which means basically he was part of every one of us, including Robert Pope. From Robert Pope to, to present day um, Jordan Packard, he's been involved on every one of them. So this is a committee that is totally, totally invested in, in the program, next generation, and, 
And I think that's what makes us so special and so unique. We don't do it for any other reason but just the passion of the, of the trade and the love of country. Jeff, what's, what's your reason for all the support? Because, you know, you've been involved with this for such a long time. My reason is I want, uh, I want these guys to add to our workforce for the United States. We, uh, our skills have been dropping, you know, with numbers coming out. And we need to, to bolster the image of, of hardworking trades, whether it's an electrician, a welder, a plumber, all of those kinds of things. These, this is what does it. And I had, at one of our competitions when we used to do it at AWS show, I had an engineer from Lockheed Martin come up to me and look at the, the uh, pressure vessel and uh, sheet metal projects. And he says, Jeff, uh, tell number two, number six, and number seven to have a job with us right now. And they, they weren't even picked for anything, but they were that good at that stage of the game, and that's what we want to offer to the industry, is to bring the level of, of quality workmanship up, and that's what I'm here for. Yeah, and I think, you know, when, what, Ch what Chandler was saying, uh, with, you know, his program that he's got going on, trying to, um, you know, raise the bars at the, at the state levels, what that's going to help do for the United States is, um, you know, raise the talent pool, you know, that we need for world skills and to come in and be a part of our, you know, group, our our training, our our complete program, and then also, hopefully, the chance to represent the United States um, at World Skills, and that's 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 what we need. To just point, we need to continue to raise the bar at you know these young young stages and in, in these individuals' lives, and, and uh, that'll that'll help the United States out in more ways than just World Skills. Mm -hmm. Joe, I haven't heard from you yet. What was what was your reasoning for getting involved in skills in the first place? Was it, you know, your instructor, or do you, you hear about some of the stories to get involved with it? Or he's, yeah. he's like one of the most humble people I've ever met. And like <laughs> Stephanie Hoffman and I, we give him crap all the time because he's he's very very quiet, very humble. He does he doesn't say much, but he's a super yeah. talented guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I uh, I got into it really uh, inspiration from welding instructor and in, uh, Glenn K. He uh, and really another welding instructor as well, Clyde Hall, they kind of seen potential in me. Kind of like circling back to how you kind of kick things off. You know, it was uh, somebody seen something in you, and they wanted to share that. And obviously, I was passionate about it. Once I struck an arc and really kind of understood what I was getting myself into, I was like, hey, man, I could probably take the ball and run with this. You know, one thing led to another. And for me, really, it was once I made it to the – the level where I kind of understood the legacy that was at play. You know, you meet Brandon, Nick, Ray, and, you know, Glenn, obviously, he was a big part of it. Um, you kind of understood. You're like, man, this is kind of a pretty cool deal. And then you're going to represent the United States amongst other countries. Like, hell yeah, man, I want to win. You know, I didn't, I'm not coming here to just, you know, grind metal. I mean, I'm good at grinding, but I want to win, you know what I mean? So, anyhow... It was kind of like one of those things, and then they start sharing, and they do a lot to support it. And, and it's really cool from my perspective to see how it's changed, um, you know, since I went through the whole process and kind of how it's always constantly growing and evolving. And I think that's something to appreciate, you know. Maybe I've shared a little feedback, and now later on down the road, you might have a whole slew of gold medalists or a whole slew of, you know, competitive uh, individuals. And and one thing that I took is once I kind of went through it and, you know, competed, I tried to pass all that information along to Brad. You know, him and I at, were at the same school and, you know, I shared that information. I was like, hey, you can do this. This is, you know, here's the secret sauce. And I think it's not so much the secret sauce. I think it's you got to find the right individual who's got that fire inside them that wants to win and wants to absorb all of the knowledge that everybody's trying to share, say, hey, we, you know, all we want to do is tell you how to do it. You can do it. But you got to find that individual who can just take it to that next level and set the bar for the next individual coming in. And I think, you know, Brad, you kind of did that. Why don't you share, you know, what, what, what that was like for you? Right under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to stay low key, man. You just yeah, blew up a spot. I knew as soon as you called him out, I was next. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, a lot along with what Joe said, I started welding in high school. I was fortunate to have a high school program that had welding, um, and that carried me on to Washtenaw Community College uh, to continue my welding education. And it wasn't shortly after there, I mean, or starting there, I went to nationals because in high school we competed. I was never good in high school and then made it to college and went to nationals. And during that time, uh, when I was competing at nationals, Joe was actually doing the pre-trials, literally, you know, a few curtains away. So I got to see him go through, you know, this whole process. And then inevitably, I was, I was next in line. And, and I think Joe was the one that really, really found the fire in me because I was kind of, after nationals, a little bit burned out, was working. And, and, you know, brought that fire back to me and inspired me to, you know, hey, you know, I do want to be the best because I don't want to work where I was working at the time. Like, it's not going back to there. We're going to, we're stepping this up and we're getting out of here. We're doing something. And so, you know, basically poured, poured my heart and soul into it and, you know, followed that path and took the training from Joe, you know, his, his worldly advice. <laughs> Old wise yeah. one. Careful following those ones. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but yeah, just to just to be good and and be on a whole nother level. Like it's like everybody said. It's I think there's a lot of talent everywhere, not just per state or country. There's talent all over the world. It's like Joe said, finding the fire, finding the drive, and the person just give up everything around you and just go for it. Like, like uh, you know, I thought, like, yesterday I was thinking, I was like, you know, when I was competing, I wasn't texting. People didn't text me. <laughs> like, they didn't even call me. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like that stuff. Oh, don't don't feel bad. Nick yeah. was getting faxes while he was in. The- <laughs> <laughs> his pager was going on. His pager. Yeah. Pagers I went through during Yeah. So like. <laughs> <laughs> so like the distractions that exist today, where a notification comes on your phone because somebody liked your post you put on Facebook. Like, I still don't give two rats about any of that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, uh, what's what's next? Like, you know, that, that's got to be pretty difficult, especially in today's day and age where, like, everything is instant in your face and all the time there's constant distractions everywhere. Like, how do you sit down and focus and train with with all the other stuff going on, especially being, a, like, a U.S. competitor where, you know, like we were talking about, you still have to work. You've got a job. You've got additional stresses. You have other commitments that you still need to maintain in addition to, you know, the welding and, and learning this stuff and, and putting in the, you know, the long hours, like you were saying, you know, you're out there till midnight, one o'clock in the lab, and then somebody's got to get up at, you know, welders, for some reason, we get to work at like early, you know, five, six o'clock in the morning. So you're only getting a few hours of sleep and you're doing that for months on end, you know? So, I mean, like you were saying, you've got to have that, that drive, that determination, that focus. Um, it's got to be a little bit more difficult now with, with everything that we have going on, you know, in society and in the world. And um, you guys brought it up, the talent, you know, that, that's out there right now. And it, it's insane. We were back there looking at the uh, the pieces and the coupons that, you know, these young men and women out there are putting out. And a lot of them, I mean, it looks like it came fresh off the Cobot. The cobot. You're like, man, the, like the precision that they have, the focus, is it's incredible to see that. To add to that precision and focus, I said it earlier, perfect isn't good enough. And there's no such thing as perfect. But I vow to attain it. <laughs> That's the mindset. you got to be striving for extreme excellence in everything you do mindset that is one of the challenges going back to technology distractions that you were talking about um everybody wants a rocky montage you know it's it's uh you you watch youtube you watch you know this uh, how many how many millions and trillions of views do uh um like a david goggins motivational short get you know um and jocko willinks all these other people and talking you know you gotta stay hard you gotta go at it every day and who's gonna carry the boats yeah well that's yeah right well no it's all motivation it's all true but for welding uh it's not like you can make a montage video of you know when you're running or throwing a football and there's action that's happening you're moving inches per minute 
So sometimes that's an inch per minute, depending on what you're doing. And then you're grinding, and then, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, technicalities of just working through the scoring system and knowing what you're working to, the criteria you're working to. That's incredibly difficult, and it's an incredibly difficult hurdle to, to cross when you talk about this new generation with the technology that we have. Um, I, I identify with Brad. I was not getting text messages and, and all that stuff. Instagram and Facebook. I got a smartphone in 2013 that did not have the capable capability of having Instagram and Facebook, so I was... Uh, I was fortunate in that aspect, but um, yeah, no, that is something that uh, we, we've been seeing more and more. I've been seeing more and more, especially just people coming in working, never mind competing, and they have that distraction. They have that, you know, Rocky montage mentality, like, oh, I'm going to become a welder, I'm a badass. It's like, yeah, um, well, it doesn't really happen like that. It's hours and hours of, of looking, you're putting a box on your head and looking at a bright light out of a two by four piece of glass. And they want to make thirty bucks an hour. So yeah, right, yeah first, right off yeah, the there's a, there's a, there's a lot that that, that we're we're uh, we're up against when it comes to that. But I think it's the storytelling, like what you're doing with the podcast, what Jody does with the uh, the YouTube uh, videos, and and uh, what Chandler does with the projects that are the challenges that are put out there with the with the different. Um, this is what we would do at the World Skills. You can buy the kit and you can try it yourself and see how it is. A lot of guys got back to me when he put out that first kit, and they were like, oh, yeah, it looked really good, right? I said, yeah, it did. Did it meet the criteria? And I'd give him some of the criteria, and he's like, oh, no, I didn't get full pen. Oh, no, I didn't have bead, you know, one millimeter bead width variation, half a millimeter bead height variation. Yeah, I guess mine didn't look that good. Well, yeah, it looked great. It just didn't meet the criteria. So Do it again. There's that aspect of it of, of, of being, yeah, there's that aspect of it of, it's not just a pretty weld, and I've been told that since the beginning. You have to know the criteria, and that takes you to the next level because you're not just looking at aesthetics anymore. You're not just getting the likes. and the, Well, we weren't getting likes on Instagram just yet. We were getting the, the hits and stuff, but it brought it to the next level of ha that attention to detail. That, that's what I always try to tell you know students when they come up. You know, They'll show you a good weld. That's awesome. Do it again. And they're like, but I, but I did it. And I was like, yeah, you, you got it right. Don't do it till you get it right. Do it until you can't get it wrong. And then, and then once, you, once you can't get it wrong, then start challenging yourself. Put obstacles in your way. Crawl up underneath the table. You know, hang that piece upside down. Get up underneath there. Get into a position where you're, you know, the ABCs of welding. Always be comfortable. Get uncomfortable. Can you do that with your non-dominant hand? You know, because when you're out here in the booth, like I haven't competed in Skills USA, but I can only imagine you can't fixture everything just so to where you know you can get perfect access and everything's going to be nice and smooth and like you know you can't do that so practice until you can't get it wrong yeah just well the only thing i wanted to add to it and as we're sitting here talking i'm i'm going back and i'm remembering you know some of the challenges we had with my students but then on the other side of it you know my school was very supportive of allowing me to have you know, a student who had already graduated, come back, work in our lab, you know, full access, whatever, you know. And, you know, and then I think about where were you working at? Out of your basement, doing your training at your house, in your basement, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing to do that and be able to be competitive, you know. So, I mean, we had really good support and, you know, I think, but, but that's what, if you see a lot of the schools that are successful, it's because they're they're given that support and and having a good instructor. But when you do it and have to overcome, you know that lack of support and having to work out of your basement. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me. Yeah. Back to the um, you know the do it again topic. Um, you know, my instructor, high school instructor, was one of those instructors uh, that you know. How do I know that you weren't lucky? You know that 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 first time, and uh, so yeah, the the repeatability was was there, and that I think that's what you know helped me get to where I got in the end. However, I got a little story about you know I used to race motocross professionally in high school, and I broke my right arm, which was my dominant you know TIG welding arm and gas and oxyacetylene um, welding, and you know here I was thinking I was going to get to go in the shop class for a few hours a day, and you know maybe hang around, do nothing, um, but he made me start welding with my left hand, and I had to put the filler rod in my cast in my right hand and feed it, and so I actually became a dominant left hand TIG welder, 
and I'm very good with right my right hand too. And that helped me, you know, after world skills in the trades, I was a steam fitter, local 439 out of East St. Louis, and I was able to be the welder that had the, you know, welding the stub pieces straight out of the wall that were sticking out of a wall six inches because I could come from the right side with my right hand and then go up against the wall on the left side and do it with my left hand because I could do it with both hands. And, and I can only thank my high school instructor for that, you know, so... So now as a, as a committee here, are you guys focusing on, you know, getting more people involved, uh, kind of bringing the good word to the different uh, high schools and colleges and trade schools and, you know, to, to inspire more folks to get in there? Always. I mean, that's that I think that's our number one hardest or biggest challenge is trying to get get as much exposure to our committee, the program, the standards that we work with. Uh, the level of expectations that we have. Uh, we, we preach it, we say it, we do little videos. I think everybody here has been interviewed at some point in time. We put booklets out, pamphlets out, Skills USA national competitions. Uh, when we go to those events, we talk to all the educators that's in the room, trying to ex ex educate everybody what is world skills. Uh, we have pressure vessels from all the different events, whether it be international, that we've been able to bring back here or pressure vessels from events that we've done here in the U.S. during our selection process. And we try to get those out to as many schools, as many people as possible, just to try to get the exposure out. But no matter how hard we try, it's still a big nation. It's a big, you know, um, uh, it's a big hurdle for us to try to make contact with everybody. I mean, I think we do, we do what we can and, and I guess the other way of looking at it, too, is you got to remember everything that we do, I think almost everybody here would say this is almost like a full-time job, right? But the flip side is this is we volunteer. We all have our jobs that we do today. The AWS World Skills Competition Committee, which we're all members of, we're all part of, everything that we do, it, all the actions that we take, all the training programs that we do throughout the, throughout the years, it's all volunteer. So we, we do what we can and uh, with what we've got to work with, and I'd still say it's phenomenal, a, a phenomenal job, but could we improve? Absolutely. Um, you know, get Nick to start doing some TikTok dances and stuff. TikTok dances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One time down there in Florida. Yeah. The, the jet car challenge. Oh, yeah, 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 we did that. They had the jet car. Yeah. We had Andrew doing the worm on that one, man. That was awesome with the Larson Motorsports. Yeah, that, the Harlem Shake. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We're old, man. We're really old. You know. You know, one of your questions might be, you know, how do you get into all, how do you get to world skills as a welder? It starts with Skills USA. You need to compete at Skills USA at your state level. You need to win your state and you need to get to nationals. And then when you get to nationals, if you're age eligible from nationals, and in the easiest way I remember age eligibility, so for my year, for example, in 1993, if I turned 23 years old in the year of 1993, I would have been too old to compete. That's a world skills rule, period. And you can only do world skills once in your life. And once you're in, you're in, that's it. And it's, uh, it's very intense. But to get there, you got to win state, be your gold medalist at state, get to nationals, compete, and be age eligible. So all age eligible are invited to our pretrial process. Depending on timing and things, we're going to typically have two complete turn-ins of world projects, which actually... They just voted this week what the next 2024 Lyon, France projects will be. We will have that ahead of time. 30% about it, roughly 30% changes at Lyon, but we have all the projects ahead of time. We know the score system. We know the projects. And you're able to, it's just like Sean White and Olympic snowboarders. You know the game. How do you perform? It's you versus the score system. It's, it's kind of like golf even. We can have all the golf anywhere in the world, but when we're together, we're still scoring it the same. And it's you versus the score system at World because they'll give away multiple gold medals. So we get you age eligible. We turn you all in. We do everything at the World Skills scoring, projects, everything the way the way the World Skills competition is going to happen. And so it starts right then and there after National Skills USA. All the pretrial stuff comes in, and after that we take take the best six, take them to a tune-up event in Huntsville, Alabama, at Robotics Technology Park at AIDT amazing facility hopefully you'll come back to that next mm -hmm. time and see that 
And so we do one week tune up there to teach them all the little things from us that we know, because it's different at World. It's different. <laughs> it's perfection. And, and there's a lot of other things. So we teach that, and we do it again in January. And then we have the final competition to pick the one. And we'll invite our international friends at that time, too. And so that we'll have a little bit of extra international flavor. And I got a great picture of Joe Young. People will say, why do you bring your international competitors there? Well, we're not competitors. It's like golf. It's me versus the score system. We brought Joe, um, the Australian competitor, and I can't think of his name Josh. right now. Josh. Um, I have a photo of Josh and um, Joe sitting next to each other at the world competition when all the other competitors are like, they're on pins and needles freaking out. These two guys are cutting it up laughing. You know, we that's just Joe. did. Yeah, <laughs> that's Joe. But we tell took the chicken roping story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but we took their stress level down by having, hey, instead of, who's this competitor? You know, you got this evil eye on him, right? Instead, it was, we're all brothers and sisters in welding. You know, we're here to do our thing. And so they, they, their stress level was less. They could focus on the competition more. And we do a lot of those techniques ourselves at our competition level. Um, at our the other thing, too, to add is one of the, the things, too, is because we're, a lot of us are all past, well, most all of us are all past, you know, uh, competitors. Uh, we've all traveled international. We're vested in this whole program and, um, and everything else that we're, we're doing. We know the scoring criteria. We know the technical descriptions inside and out and better than most anybody. And our job, I think our hardest job, even during the selection process, is, is training everybody to what those rules and requirements are at the international level. I think there's some misconceptions. We don't create the scoring criteria. We don't create the pressure vessels and the projects and the weld sequencing and stuff of that nature. We know international world skills criteria inside and out because we are a de very detail-orientated group. We understand the rules. We've been there. We've done it. And our job is to kind of decipher it and then train and educate next generation to where they understand all the expectations that we put out in front of them as well. So I think that's one of the things, too, as far as, as we're doing all the selections, <clears throat> what, what the majority of the nation knows when it comes to Skills USA is what like the state level competitions look like, the scoring criteria, the projects. Those then they get to go to nationals and they get to work those blueprints, those projects, and then there's a ginormous leap from nationals to international. And it's very, very hard for many schools, educators, contestants to understand how drastic that that change of um, you know quality is or or specifications are. It's a ginormous leap. I mean, you guys might have a better way of saying it, um, but that that <clears throat> that is the probably the biggest thing, or <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the biggest gap that we have to try to overcome is the uh, the criteria from a national competition to what it's like at na international. It, it's, it's, it's totally different. Now, are the guys, like the different state competitions? Are they the same across? all 50 states to where they're working on the same print or it's up to that state to put forth whatever that, wow that's surprising there's the answer is yeah. the yeah. there's no. an effort there's going on okay effort. so because yeah, i mean American like if, if everybody has to come and compete on the same thing to go up to nationals which is going to be a standard competition to you know up to world skills usa and that's going to be a standard across the board every state should be training the same way and then every i would say you know even before that Regionals should have the same competition. I mean, I've been to several different, you know, I volunteer to judge on skills competitions in my regional area. Every year, it's something a little bit different. Um, so I don't know if that's the same across the board, you know, across all 50 states or, or not. You hit my hot button. I was at all. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably all of our hot button. So here recently, there has been a big push, and I think it originated at this committee for a trickle down effect. So where international is affecting the projects at nationals and the scoring now, and that has trickled down to the state level some, and then there's a push for that to trickle down onto the regional levels. Now, it's a process. Um, I, I don't think that there's any way to mandate it, but if they're smart, they'll they'll do it. You know, they'll they'll use that to help the competitors. There's There's gotta be a way to mandate that, just for the simple fact that like, 
the criteria should be the same. Everybody needs to know exactly what they're getting into to understand the level of competition that they got to bring and train for. Bingo. Um, you know, Martika Ventura, who we have, who should be in here because she is our backbone that keeps us. She's with the American Welding Society, and Martika Ventura really keeps us all in line and does things. But she works with Skills USA uh, through the American Welding Society. And so the most recent thing, Ed Norman, who is the chair of the National Welding Competition Committee, um, along with Chandler Vincent, Martika met with all the Skills USA state directors this last uh, few months ago. There's information being sent to every state director. Scoring scheme, projects from weldermade.com, where you can have everybody have laser cut same projects. And this all stemmed from the virtual national welding competition. So what happened? 2020, we all know that. There was no Skills USA National Championship. 2021, there was a virtual one. And when we were asked to execute a virtual welding competition, Chandler, Martika, myself, a, a number of other committee members, certainly Ed Norman, we all sat down. There's no way we're doing it. I said, I think we can figure this out. They're like, what do you mean? Well, we've already got a score system that's all A, yes, B, no criteria. You either meet it. We have the American Welding Society, and we have certified welding inspectors. So Martika got – we had 64 competitors across the nation between high school and college that got through the process because all the virtual. And we were able to get 64 volunteer CWIs where you were able to train them to use the same scoring system uh, that we use at nationals. We were able to execute that scoring system using our sponsor, zipgrade.com, that's the official sponsor for us at our World Skills Competition Committee, where it's bubble sheets and simple stuff. So we were able to train those judges to be impartial judges, to use the same score system everywhere. And then the beautiful thing was we had Ashley Applegate at uh, Kentucky Welding Institute donate. He's a good uh, dude. Yeah, great guy. He donated a, a significant amount of money to pay for Chandler Vincent to laser cut and ship those parts to every contest. So we had the exact same parts, exact same score system, and an impartial judge. Because that's the only aspect that we could control of this contest. But if there's anything we need in all of these competitions is the same score system. The same mentality. We use AWS standard terms and definitions, AWS standard symbols. Everything we do is based off of AWS standards. But when it comes to evaluating those projects, taking advantage of what Chandler's built to have quality projects that align with our national projects, to have a score system that is fast, fair, and defendable so that you can truly pick gold, silver, and bronze because that's what our job is. You know, welding code, I say, gives you a 180-degree window of slop. Um, our Skills USA national score system gives you a 45-degree window, 45 degree window to be in. The world skills gives you two parallel windows to be in, incredibly, incredibly tight. So it's a stepping stone, right? We're tighter than code. Because if we just evaluated contests with welding code, we could pick the two losers that didn't pass code, and we got everybody else that passed. Because code is forgiving, mm -hmm. and it needs to be, and it's, and it's right. It's different application. Different application. Competition is there's only Test one, a skill set. two, and three. So you need the one side of the bell curve. So you have to make it tougher, significantly tougher. So I'll give you one of our score criteria. Weld number blank. Judges pick which weld they want to evaluate. Porosity. There shall be no visible porosity. Does the weld meet this criteria? A, yes. B, no. And if it's challenged, you can look at the part and say, there was visible porosity. See that one, that one, that one, that's porosity. Yeah. It doesn't tell us size or anything like code would because at competition, and especially at this level, <laughs> porosity is even more intense. So that's very forgiving, actually, what we just did. And so it's a challenge to get everybody to start evaluating welds the same way, something that Brandon's worked on over the years, something I'm trying to drive through the American Welding Society. I, I'm a board member now, which is quite an honor as well. And I want to see us come up with a standard at AWS to evaluate welding competitions so that's all fair. So everybody's looking at it the same because you're 0 to 10, my 0 to 10. Of course, all of us 0 yeah, to 10 hate, is a different I hate story. That scoring system. Yeah, it's random. How do, yeah. you, how do you truly? You can't quantify that. Yeah. And it's not the same across the board. I mean, if you're going to judge something, everybody's got to be on the exact same page and the criteria has got to be so focused and minute, it either is or it isn't. Yeah. I mean, that way it's, it's not left up to interpretation. Yeah. You've got you to ditch the uh, subjective scoring yeah. criteria. Yeah and, you, back to objective. yeah, and you have to have 
it's just got to be the same across the board. And, and the other thing is, you know, kind of what we have is it's, you if you like porosity, if you have a well. I don't like porosity. Yeah. But if you, yeah, yeah nobody does. <laughs> but that, you know, that question can be applied to all welds or just the one. How much time do you have to execute your contest? How many welds do you have going on? Even as a teacher, I just give a fillet weld, and if I apply all that criteria to the fillet weld. But when, what the competitor wouldn't know, they would know the questions we ask. But you wouldn't know what welds they're applied to because of statistical quality analysis. So if somebody said, why can't I, how do I practice for this? Well, how about you practice getting all the points on all the welds, including your overhead, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That's, that's what I like when, when I was talking to Chandler. He said, you know, you focus on what are the most common mistakes, and then you, try, you weed those out. How do I, you know, prevent underfill? I mean, that one's pretty simple. But, like, how do I make sure I've got, you know, good fusion, full penetration on these welds? If that's, you know, a, a problem that's commonly reoccurring, what do I need to practice? What do I need to focus on to make sure that that doesn't happen? And then everything else is just going to fall into place. Yeah. You know, once, once you start getting, you know, canceling out all those mistakes, all the, all the things that could go wrong, everything kind of works out after that. Yeah, and it's even interesting at this level, you know, if you – the score system is so intense and there's different levels of things and you might be really good at something that's only giving you 0.1 but you're losing the one point thing you might not have to sacrifice something else to get that bigger point that's how intense you have to focus on this kind of like a chess game yeah yeah very much and so it's not a small task so if an if an instructor from high school level or post secondary or you know college level you know age criteria if they wanted to get involved where where do they start you know, what's the best place to go for resources? You know, if I'm a welding instructor and I want to, you know, start getting my kids prepped up for, you know, skills regionals and, and possibly state and nationals, where do I start to get that information? Well, the state, yeah, aws.org, but the state director, like Nick was saying, the state director should have all this stuff because AWS makes sure, makes sure that every state director has, skills, skills USA state director has all of this information. And uh, talking a little bit further back, there's two sides of the spectrum. Brandon was talking about, you know, there is a big gap, you know, um, and, and uh, some people don't see the the, the gap, you know, they, they don't see that, uh, oh, I, it's just welding, you know, they weld to code and they don't see the expectations that we're looking for. But then there's the other side, and that's the other side that I hear a lot of when I go around to the different schools. I ran the, I was the event manager this year at the State Skills USA competition, and a lot of the uh, things that I heard from either past, um, past competitors who came back and helped out or, or visited or the instructors is they say, well, it's not obtainable, you know, only a certain number of schools, you know, the same schools get picked every year and, you know, it's all rigged. I don't know how many times all of us have heard that, that myth. And I kind of want to debunk that right now. There is no, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, all the cronies and we're all, you know, Utah's going to win every year because Chandler's there, or, you know, it's going to be Washington every year because Joe Young and Brad Clank and Alex, that's not the case case is is that we know the scoring criteria and we know how to train to it and it's easy it, it's not easily obtainable but it's easily accessible to get that information because there was a time that everything was hush hush there was a time where my instructor Dan Rivera called Brandon and said hey can you give me some uh some of your notes and on, on how to do 7018 open route all of us know the 7018 route open route uh, overhead that's the one thing that we all had struggled with and he said, you know, we don't really give out that type of information until you make it and prove yourself to get to the top three uh, training. But you have to, you know, make it past the top six. That's really the only time. Other than that, all the other information is out there. Um, like Nick said about porosity, make sure you don't have porosity. I mean, that's the, the one thing is it's a pet peeve, and I have to, I guess, air it right now, is I was at Nash, I was at state competition and I talked to all the kids afterwards, um, all the students afterwards, the competitors, and the instructors, I allowed them to come in because I wanted to kind of make it feel like a national field. The instructors were allowed to come in, and they were invited to come. Um, I said, a 2F 7018 quarter-inch fillet weld should be a no-brainer. That's ABCs of welding. That's the brand spanking new welder. And we have state competitors that are coming here, and they, and they struggle with that. So it's not that there's cronies that are always winning. It's the people who know how to do a 2F 7018 quarter-inch fillet weld, and they know how to make a quarter-inch fillet weld, and there's no spatter, and there's no porosity, and there's no undercut, and you go right down the line. There's no smoke and spatter on the project. Um, 
Right. There's, there's, you know, they, they know the criteria. So um, there's some people that say, well, it's not obtainable, and they just, you know, kind of uh, you know, brush it off. There's the other people that's, that think it's too obtainable, and, you know, they don't realize the gap. So we try to address both, and we try to make sure that, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to every story. We try to shoot right down the middle, and this is what we're doing. The information is out there. The state, the SkillsUSA state directors do have it. They, they have they have the information and that, and we right and and if if you really have a, a couple of the instructors I talked to if you really have that big of an issue about it why don't you volunteer as a judge the next year this coming year volunteer as a judge normally it's about January time frame they start reach out to the state director uh, skills USA state director and say who's the event manager for welding I'd like to volunteer as a judge they'd be happy to take it because I'm guaranteeing you they, they don't have anybody who actually wants to be there there's a lot of people who don't want to be there. The instructors that have the passion and the ones that don't. Oh, that's a big thing across our industry as a whole. Yep, I agree. The one thing I want to add to what Andrew was talking about, um, you know, kind of people thinking that there's a couple schools that we favor or anything like that at the top level. Um, it is in our best interest to involve every school in every state, in every area of the world, that wants to participate, right? There, there's certain levels that we, we give you documents and information as far as blueprints and, and scoring criteria. And there is a time that we don't open up our, our full Team USA playbook to everybody because we want to, we want to see you put in a certain amount of effort to get a certain amount, you know, to get far enough in the stage to where we know you are ready to consume the additional information. Right, so if, if you're not reading the original documents we sent you and making it to a certain point, we know you're not going not gonna to study and take the, the additional information as serious as you need to. And so, um, you know, the, the big thing now is, is, is the Utah crew because the, where I'm located and what I'm trying to do to get everybody involved in my area. But I'd like to add, before I won, um, I was the first World Skills competitor from Utah. And... So I'm, I'm living proof that, you know, you look up to these guys that are doing it, you, you get involved with the right people and uh, work your butt off, and your state could be the next Utah or the next Washtenaw. You know, that uh, you talk about the competitions, and, and you see some disparity between different schools and different states. And, you know, I took a lot of pride in, you know, I felt like a lot of time my students were successful because we worked harder, you know. But you would go to competitions, and Brandon ran Georgia's state welding competition for a long time. And he can tell you, you know, it was usually first, second, third were kind of close, and then after that it was a pretty big gap. I mean, I remember one year, you know, as the students were given their stack of metal and a blueprint, and they're like, here you go. And the student welded the pieces together as they were just stacked up on top of each other. He had no idea how to look at a blueprint and, and they were, you know, and that's how they were turned in, just like they were stacked up and handed to him. And so, you know, yeah, you know, and so, well, the, so the state of Georgia Department of Education, they offer some, you know, uh, summer training. They, they, call it Camp T&I, and I'm sure other states do something like this. And it's for skilled trades primarily because it's through their, you know, career in tech. And so I had went to some of those classes for like sheet metal years ago, and then some years there's good stuff and some years there's not. And uh, about five or six years ago they asked me, they were like, look, we hadn't had a really good welding class for high school instructors in years. You know, is that something – you'd be interested in helping out with. And I was like, shoot, yeah, because it's, you know, two and a half day hands-on training. You're not sitting listening to somebody try to sell you something. And they were like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I'm going to have these instructors do the state welding project. What the students had to do, you know, in, in the springtime, it's what we, I had them do. And because I felt like if the students were struggling, maybe it's because the instructors you know, we're not, because you can't be an expert at everything, and mm -hmm. so you'd have instructors. Maybe they're not really, you know, uh, had a lot of experience in certain processes or certain things. 
And so I remember doing it the first year, and the instructors were like, golly. I mean, they were struggling to tack them together correctly. And they were like, oh, I forgot how hard this really was, you know. And so we did that. And, and like I say, we've done it for several years. Uh, we did the state welding project, you know, for the first two or three years. And then we've changed it up, and we've actually ordered some projects from, you know, uh, welder made and had those projects that we've done. So we've had to, you know, change it up. But each year I've asked them, hey, if we do this again next year, what do y'all need help with? And, and you know, it's a full spectrum. You know, sometimes it's a, I mean, we had, uh, you know, teachers who've never, I mean, you know, welding instructors they've never taught before. And then you've got some that are within a couple of years of retirement. So what they're asking for help for is different a lot of times. And I try to, you know, if there's a, a guy on one end, hey, I need some help on aluminum. You know, I'm not really good with that. And then, but the rest of the class might be working on. So we try to, you know, do that. But that's where a lot of them need the help. You know, you go to these state competitions and, you know, just trying to offer the help. You know, and that's where a lot of people um, they don't know where to go to get the help. And you know, I mean, I think we're really fortunate in doing that summer program has grown um, this past year we were probably double what I remember us ever having as far as you know instructors coming and attending it um, and, and you know I just I think that that's a way and I'm helping instructors that I'm gonna and one of them told me last year he said you're the one we want to beat you know and I hear I am I'm, I'm sharing information and trying to help them but it's to get everybody you know you know, it's not it's not about me trying to hide secrets. It's I'm I'm there sharing stuff. Anything that I know, I'll try to help them out to raise the bar. Yeah, and if if you know if I'm fortunate enough to have the student who is maybe the best performer there, so be it. But if I'm not, I'm not. You know, and um, but now the competitive side of me wants to win every year, but that ain't gonna happen. Now you definitely want to win, and I, I think it's great that you're you're starting with the instructors, because that's where, at the end of the day, that's where the information has to come from. Because if the students don't understand, it's, you know, partially because of the instruction. You've got to make sure, I know, I've, <laughs> that's one of that's one of the hills that I'm going to die on, is like, we've got to change the industry when it comes to welding education. There's a lot of people back there that, I mean, they're there for the wrong reasons, or they're not well equipped to be in the spot that they're in, but they've got the passion and the drive to do it. But if somebody's got the passion and the drive and I can send them to a class or bring somebody in to help them, they're going to pick it up. They're going to, and then they're going to want to share that information with the students. So, I mean, starting with the educators, we've, we've got to make a bigger push to make that happen. I know AWS does the Instructors Institute. Uh, Lincoln does the Welding Educators Workshop. I didn't know about your class. I know uh, Weld Ed has a class going on. Ryan Eubank puts a class on. I mean, we've in Weld Labs, you know, they're, they're walking around meeting with other instructors. But that's where it's got to start, is bring, raising the bar for the instructors. It, it all, I, every, I guarantee you, everybody sitting here at this table can probably point to one instructor that got them to this point, started it, you know, started it. And it's usually a high school instructor. You know, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it was a college or, you know, whatever. But I guarantee you, everybody in here can point to one instructor and say, that's who got me headed in the right direction. And it was somebody with passion. It was somebody with drive. You know, it wasn't somebody that just took the easy road. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to kick my feet up and take it easy and, you know, y'all go do whatever you want to do. It was somebody that had drive and passion. Yep. Now Martika's with us. Yeah, so Martika, where, as an instructor that wants to get more involved with Skills USA, where can they go to find out, you know, the information, resources, scoring criteria, and uh, all that information to, to get a, you know, to start a program in their school. Basically, <clears throat> excuse me, basically me. me. Come to me. My, my email address is mventur at aws.org. I'll put that in the show notes as well. But then in addition to that, is there something on aws.org? Not yet. We're working on it. Okay. We've been updating the World Skills Committee website, and we'll probably have that up and running for the next cycle. Um, but for the meantime, it's, it's just me. Okay. Fantastic. Anybody got any closing remarks before we wrap this up? Joe? Heck yeah, I the do. The talkative one. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> so I think before we wrap up, um, I'd like to get everybody's thoughts on 
one, what was the best world skills moment you had? And two, what is the hardest weld that you had to make during that contest? So I'm going to kick it off. When I had to do the vessel I had, it was a bugger. And it was this weird looking triangle deal. I couldn't explain it to you if I had tried. But there was an overhead weld that had like, I don't know, maybe six inches to get underneath it. And it wasn't the fact of making the weld. It was the fact that when they pumped that thing up to 1,000 PSI, if that weld was going to burst or not. And I remember when I fit my vessel up and everything, there was like a probably a good quarter inch gap that I had to fill the way this lap weld was situated. And boy, we gave her the onion. We got her filled and it held. So, <laughs> oh yeah, you had to on that one. But it's a good thing they didn't see the backside. Anyhow, <laughs> I think my favorite world skills moment was really when it kind of clicked is I was with Brandon, Nick, and Ray, and we were down in Atlanta, and I was doing training. And I'll never forget, I was goofing something up on a horizontal plate, and for whatever reason, I was just undercutting and undercutting and undercutting on this very last, like, the final pass. And I think Ray was like, what are you doing, dude? Like, you're sitting completely wrong. Like, just looked at me like dead in the eyes. Like, I had been, I don't know how many miles of plate that I had welded up into this point until Ray was like, here, don't sit on the right side of the plate, sit on the left side of it. And then after that, it was like, wow, how was I this, like, soft in the head not to realize that, you know? <laughs> but, and, and I think that's kind of, like, goes back to the caveat of everybody thinks there's some kind of secret sauce, you know, to get to this elite level. It really is. It's not there. We want to give you all of the tools. It's just we want to find the person with that extra special. You want somebody to come fire. and take it. Yeah, we want to, if you got the gumption and you got the gall, you're the folk, you're the people that I want. So, but I'm going to hand things off to Brandon here and he can share his, his moment. I'm trying, I'm trying to think what my moments were. The, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, the, what sticks out in my mind, I'll just go that route, is the pressure vessel is what has the most points tied to it. So the pressure vessel uh, from the scoring goes from 0, 25, 50 points, depending upon where it, where it holds and, and so on. Um, the whole competition when I went, we had the, uh, from oxy fuel welding to, you know, all other processes. So that was one, I think one of the last years that we actually had the oxy fuel. But anyways, going back to the vessel, um, I would probably say that's my most memorable because my pressure vessel uh, leaked at 980 pounds and so full score means you have your pressure vessel has to hold a thousand psi and that's 50 points if it leaks up to uh, 500 then that's 25 points that you get and then if it goes out at city pressure then it's I think it's zero points <clears throat> with my pressure vessel leaking at 980 I was only able to get 25 points from my pressure vessel um, when the competition was over, I placed silver medal, and I was uh, three points behind gold. And so I kind of think about it, you know, th this is my memory, you know, it, it's, um, I, my pressure vessel leaked due to a base metal fatigue. It was a uh, laminar tear, nowhere near a weld, it was just a defected base plate. And uh, for, for all the welds to score as they did, and for the pressure vessel to leak the way it did do, which wasn't my doings, and to lose 25 points and still come, you know, three points behind a gold medal, that was, to me, that was, that was, you know, that's, that's my most memorable. Uh, I, I did, and, I, and that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I did right for the country, and it represented the U.S., and, and I'm proud to have had my silver medal, and knowing what got me away from a gold, I'm proud of it. I'm good. I guess I'm up, you know, mine for me, my most memorable moment really was um, I, I never placed at nationals. So I never, I went two years in a row to nationals my junior and senior year in high school. I was forced into it junior year. My high school welding teacher forced me to compete because I wanted an A in the class. He said, if we want an A in the class, then you got to compete at state. And I'm like, man, I don't want to do that. But I did, and I won. And so I won when I won state. It was that first year, I was like, wow, we go to nationals. So, All right, let's see how this goes, you know, and didn't. Didn't podium at nationals. So the next year, I'm like, well, I got to win state and get a medal at nationals next year, my senior year. So I won state again. That was cool. Went to nationals. 
didn't get on the stage with Brandon and Matt. I didn't win. But I was in the pretrial process. I was able to get through it. And when they were, we were at the AWS show in Houston that I competed. And um, I, I remember second place got called up. And I thought, oh, man, I was hoping to at least get second. You know, I never got a medal at nationals. I never got, you know, and I'm like, man, if I could just, if I could have got second, that would have been cool. And then they called my name first place. And I, I might hear my neck standing up talking about it right now. Because I sat there and I literally, my, I went, I dropped my jaw to the floor. I paused for I don't know how long. And I was just like, oh, what? And I walked to that podium and, and the rest is history. I mean, what a, what a life-changing moment. That, that was probably the biggest for me. Um, and, and again, I, 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 without saying the, my negative thing is just I wish I would have been a more open-minded young man at the time to absorb the immense amount of effort people put for me. And uh, so that would be my regret, is not absorbing it as well as I should have. Um, that's my hindsight. We'll start with the most memorable moment here. Um, I... <laughs> Oh, yeah, keep it, it welding related. It wasn't the long Sundays in the welding lab with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Scary time>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the most memorable moment was uh, at World Skills in London when I finished my stainless project, which was the last thing I had to do. I looked up outside the curtain, and Joe was out there. And he was doing some dance about time. And I'm like, you know, I didn't really know, but apparently I finished with like five minutes. <laughs> and I remember walking out with that stainless project into the center where all the, the projects were. And basically everybody had theirs turned in, besides a few people. And I set that project down on that table and I, that was like the first time I looked out over everybody's stuff and I was like, whoa, like, mine's actually good. <laughs> 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 like, uh-oh. <laughs> so that's probably the most memorable moment. Because I probably, I still don't remember like any other really projects from that time. Like I don't remember seeing them just when I've turned in that stainless, just the ones that I could see across the table. Uh, and then hardest weld. I don't know. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Good answer. I can't think of one that was more difficult you know, than the rest. Made me more mad than the other one, but yeah, probably a, a 6 g seventy eighteen pipe all the way out. Don't ask why I did that, but I I practiced. So oh, my most memorable moment was when I uh, won the, the chance to represent the United States um, in Montreal, Canada, and it was most memorable, memorable because my coach um, had tried two previous times to get a competitor you know, to that number one spot, and the first time was against Brandon Mulebrandt, uh, Brian, who, who uh, was, yeah, Brian Minshaw who will be here this week. And so my coach, Steve Pinkle, you know, was working with Brian. Brian took second to Brandon Milbrandt, and then he tried again in a 97. So again, that was years and years of more training and effort um, to then go again. And uh, he competed against Glenn Kay and took second place again. So then, again, two years later, I come along. And uh, when my name was called as the, uh, you know, the, the person um, to be that guy, he started crying, and uh, so did I, and I'm kind of choking up a little bit right now, um, just remembering that moment. And uh, so, yeah, obviously that was very memorable. Um, hard as well, and probably one that my coaches and uh, uh, teachers and well, or instructors hated as well because I can't tell you how many um, probably good electrodes I wasted after I stuck them in the, in the plate and chucked them across the, the bay was the overhead 7018 uh, um, AC. 
Uh, so we, we actually, so for my world skills competition, um, we actually would receive, if we passed, uh, you know, an ISO standard with the, um, after the x-ray of the plate, uh, if we did it full AC all the way out, so it was the AC root, 7018 root, and AC fill and cap, then we were, we were given a, yeah, open root plate and overhead position, we were given a certificate if we followed that procedure the whole way out, and, uh, and I did. And, uh, but to get there, um, like I said, I can't tell you how many electrodes I stuck <laughs> to, to in, in that route because, you know, I'm, I'm working with uh, an old uh, Miller Sinker Wave 250 that, you know, the, the only bell and whistle I have to work with to help, you know, keep that from happening was uh, obviously our control, whereas a lot of these, uh, the newer machines of today, man, I mean, you can, you can almost do it one-handed with your eyes closed <laughs> now. So Yeah, you can pulse yeah. with them <laughs> yeah. and, you know, send right. your electrode positive, electro negative so, in there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my... So. Well, since I didn't compete, I'll uh, give you a little highlight. You can't believe what a pain in the rear that Texas contest was. In those days, we would rely on the local AWS section to supply material. We had so much. We get to Houston and Nothing was there, parts were missing, racing all over town trying to find some other supplier to do it, take money out of your own pocket to buy it, you know, all of that stuff. So that was memorable, so to speak. And the best was watching you compete in Montreal. I was right there behind the curtain and you didn't even know me at that time. Uh, but visiting with Ed and watching that whole contest, and it wasn't just the welding contest, it was the whole world skills was there, obviously, you know, with everything from bacon to hairdressing to whatever. Yeah, it was a pretty, pretty great event. Um, well, I, since I dropped out of the pretrial process, uh, nobody from my school had ever been through it, and so we didn't really understand how the process worked and all that. And, you know, I was a silver medalist at nationals, and the guy that beat me, he's like, ready for international and I said hell you won not me and he's like well I'm too old you know he said so I was like oh okay so I go, you know I'm going through the process and we didn't really understand it our school had never been involved with it so we didn't you know and this we're talking about 1992 so there wasn't a lot of information out there um, so about halfway through it I'm I'm having to send in stuff that I didn't feel like was representative of what I could do so I I said, look, if I can't send in my best, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to half-ass it. So I withdrew. And so then, you know, the regret of doing that, um, we were standing around, me and Brandon and Nick were standing around at Nationals one year, a few years ago, and my wife's standing there. And, and I said, yeah, I've kicked myself in the ass daily for, you know, not at least, you know, I might not have been able to go, but at least going and seeing how far I could go. I said, you know, I, I, that's, you know, I've regretted that. But then my wife put a different spin on it. She's standing there, and she said, yeah, but think about this. She said, do you think if you had went on and won and went to world and done all that, she said, do you think you'd be doing what you're doing right now, helping all the kids you've helped? And I'm like, no, nah, probably not. So, you know, I think things can happen for a reason too. So, you know, hey, I don't, you know, that, that made me feel a little bit better about, you know, dropping out so that's uh i guess my two cents you can ask the question what's your most memorable moment i i think uh nick and i have a very similar story but my most memorable moment was the night before uh i i won the right to represent the united states i had never won a medal at nationals i disqualified myself when i was competing for the 2013 world skills germany at the top three in daytona um, unbeknownst to me at the time, I put too many passes on a fillet weld and disqualified myself and came second place to Alex. He was the right person to go. Of course, disappointed in myself for making that mistake. But the night before, in 2015, in February, my mother was able to fly down to Huntsville. That was our first time competing at that facility, at the AODT Training Center. And that day, I found out that I had uh, failed a bend test on my pipe, it was a short circuit um, MIG weld for the for the cap pass on a 5G. 
I failed it, and I said, that's a lot of points. And I had the other two guys were, were right up there with me with uh, point-wise. And I said, I did it. I, I did it again. I disqualified myself. I, 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 I screwed up. I'm not going to be able to make it. So I was tore up when I got back to the hotel. So my mother said, well, why don't we take a walk? That's always her answer to things. Why don't we take a walk? So we took a walk, and that was the year that we got – I brought the snow with me. We had eight inches of snow – in Huntsville, Alabama, they shut the state down the day, day before. My mother was the last flight to land at Huntsville Airport, and they shut the airport down. We drove home in a snowstorm. There were about 20 cars off the road. So we went for a walk in this little neighborhood in the village of Providence in Huntsville, and uh, we came across this lamppost as it's a blizzard out, and the street was Hope Street. And My mother said to me, you know, Andrew, um, your hope is not in this competition. Your, host, your hope is in Christ alone. And it's to his glory that you're competing. So it's not to you that the glory is going to go to. It's to God. So anything that he gives you, he can also take it away. So if this was, you thought that this was given to you, that it was your opportunity to go because it was your second time, it's the wrong mentality. So after that, I, I really kind of came to, came to peace with it. I ended up having dinner with uh, Nick and Phil Sabi. We walked by a Mexican restaurant that was... Uh, uh, right next to the hotel, and then we had a, a great snowball fight. That snowballs were flying inside the hotel through the <laughs> sliding doors. There was whitewashing going on. There was all kinds of fun, and it really it was a that was the most memorable moment. And the next day, when they announced my name as as the winner, I could not believe it. I I was totally floored, totally surprised. I said that I all the glory to God. So, and the hardest weld at World Skills was a two G flux core on a pipe. I hate that joint. Yeah. <laughs> Ray goes, oh, <laughs> 2G flux score, trying to get that thing straight. Man, that one, that one's awful. Keeping it straight, not undercutting the, the top toe. So I've had about 30 minutes here to, uh, to think about my most memorable moment, and there's so many of them it's hard to pick. I'm not going to talk about the, the fact that I got locked up in Abu Dhabi. Again. Because that was. <laughs> that's, 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 a, a, that's on the first podcast. Because we're going to need another 45 that. minutes for that one. Um, at the competition itself, I remember, um, like as Brandon described earlier, how important the pressure test is on the pressure vessel and how heavy it's graded. Um, so if you if you fail that pressure test, um, you're you're not anywhere close to the top. And with all the testing and everything that we had done, it's you learn how easy it really is to fail something like that, um, just with the way everything is. And, uh, and so I remember working really hard um, throughout my whole competition in, in Abu Dhabi. And I had just finished up my last, my last module, which is the stainless project, and I come walking out, and I see, I see Brandon, Martika, and Ray kind of waving me over. And uh, I had thought that all the, the, all the gut-wrenching fillings were over. And I look over, and I see my pressure vessel on the table and a whole wall of media because it's the U.S. vessel it's getting pressure tested. And in that competition, they were doing the pressure test right close to the edge of the curtains where everyone could see. And I look over, and they're pointing at my vessel, and my vessel was getting pressure tested. And uh, the whole wall of media, you know, from all the different countries, is video on this vessel – and I take a seat, you know, because I'm getting kind of sick. <laughs> <laughs> I take a seat behind there, and I'm just watching that vessel. It passes, and it just the, the sigh of relief that I had done my job the way I was trained. Um, I actually performed the best that I have done, which is the way a lot of us do at competition. Um, so the sigh of relief that that was finished, I had done my job. And to see in my Weld family that are supporting me across seas was was definitely memorable. Um, another part was was during the award ceremony. I didn't I didn't uh, place as high as I hoped, and by the time I got the news that I didn't medal in the top three, I walked out of the stadium and there they were standing there ready to embrace me. And we I think we cuddled up and cried for for about thirty minutes, all of us. And I'm getting a little teared up right now thinking about it, but. Um, but anyway, I had a really good uh, kind of a flashback here in the U.S. just with the history with everybody coming in and the competition being here on U.S. soil. We had a, the team that kind of helped put all this together between Lincoln Electric, AWS, um, Skills USA, Weldermade. 
we had a VIP kind of dinner the other night, and uh, we didn't really know where we were going or what we were doing. We It was right after the opening ceremony, and uh, so we get on the bus, and next thing I know, it's the CEO of Lincoln Electric, Chris Mapes, you know, the CEO of Skills USA, all these big dogs coming in on this bus, and we're driving down the road, driving through all of downtown <laughs> uh, Cleveland, Ohio, because of traffic. And uh, I just sat back, sitting there, thinking about kind of my timeline. And uh, I want to say I don't—I haven't really gone all the way back, but I want to say is only about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, I was basically a high school dropout, going nowhere good. Um, and it just, you know, kind of a, a flashback while I was driving that bus. Within seven years of, of getting in this industry and being close to people in this room and what it's done for me and my family and uh, for my businesses, I'm, I own two, within seven years, I was able to represent my country in a skilled trade, uh, start businesses to support the industry and uh, be a welding educator to support the future generations to make sure I make the same exact impact for the younger generations coming up. And uh, so just looking back at all that, it's de definitely been a very good experience and um, a very emotional one when I st start talking about it. So. Hardest weld. Um, that is definitely the, it's hard because it's the criteria that's hard, which makes all the welds so dang hard. Um, I remember my welding instructor, Mason Winters, which is a big reason why I'm here today. Um, I travel, I moved to a different town to come train with him and go to college at his school, knowing that I was going to do this. And uh, I get there during a the summer, and I had just quit my job and moved to a different town. And uh, he opens up the shop for me. He gives me, like, big old, like, two, two jugs, a 7018 rod and a stack of plate. He says, I'm going to Lake Powell. I'm going boat, and I'll see you in two months. He says, if you don't figure out this well, I'm not training you. He's like, and he gave me a, he gave me his notes, you know, gave me some pointers, and we had a bandsaw that was cutting, um, very crooked, and uh, and so I was hand filing the bevels to straighten them up, and uh, the the precision of the fit up on that weld is very crucial, and uh, so he he tested me between my mental strength and my drive, and at the time I didn't know it, and uh, he wasn't gone for two months, he was only gone for two weeks. But he knew if I was going to quit on that hard weld, it would have been within that time. And uh, he came in, and I had little sections that were good, and then the rest went to shit. But I was getting closer, and I had not quit, and I was still trying. And that was my, my threshold into him dedicating his time in, into me. He wanted, to, he wanted to see that I had the drive without him there to make sure that I had the drive to keep going. And so... Long story short, that 7018 open root overhead weld was the the first challenge that I had to overcome to get me in in the door. And so I'd say that was probably one of the hardest. Most memorable. Um, actually, it's all of them. Watching them walk in at a young age, and then through the years to see where they go, that's, and then become like my little children. So that's cool is to watch how they grow and to young men and how they take their careers. Um, most difficult. They're all pains. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen. Thanks, Mom. It's like herding they squirrels. They don't listen. They don't follow the rules. But, <laughs> you know, eventually we get there. So but we're good. No. But we're good. It's good. It's a good, it's a good ride. It's a fun ride. And it becomes family. Yeah, that's one of the things that Chandler mentioned the other night is, you know, it's like one big family coming together, you know, and it's, it's not very often that you all get to do this in person. So it's really cool that, um, that it kind of, the event got canceled and brought back over here stateside so that we'd be able to have this opportunity. I know if, that if, if it was going to happen in Shanghai this year, I probably wouldn't be in Shanghai right now. So it's, it's really cool to come in here. You know, after I've heard about Skills USA, I've talked to a lot of the instructors and, you know, participants, stuff like that, to actually come down here and see it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to going to check out the, uh, the fab skill portion of that. I think that's one thing just outside looking in. I, I think we've, we've got to get a USA team in that competition somehow, some way. Uh, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. I'll tell you the first step that the USA needs to do to go into that contest is you need to hand flame cut as good as a table. 
dead serious that that's what we're up against. It's amazing the level of craftsmanship and precision. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Look at their tools. Yeah, I was, I was they looking use at the tools, tools that they brought over, and I was like, man, where I use a tape measure and a you know a speed square or a combination square, I mean they've got machining dial tools. calipers and machinist tools. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it's it's really impressive what they what they've got set up out there, and then they they. You know, duplicate their toolboxes so they have it one at home to practice with and then they got one to ship out here and, and work with just because you know world skills it takes you know it comes from it literally comes from a slow boat from china uh so well awesome i appreciate you guys coming out here taking the time to uh share your experience hopefully we'll be able to uh inspire some more people from this next generation to participate in skills usa you know and on behalf of all of us thank you for taking the time to to get some publicity about about what this is because this is what builds america This is what makes us have our way of life, is welders, craftspeople that do all, that that build our infrastructure in the United States to give us the quality of life we have. So thank you for bringing this to light. Oh, anytime. I'm more than happy to do it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode. Be sure to check out new episodes of Weld Wednesdays with AWS the first Wednesday of every month. For more information on how you can get involved with AWS, check out aws.org. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. Stay safe out there, and until next time, make every well better than your last.